As I research history, I find myself often walking through multiple cemeteries. Do you ever walk cemeteries? I have on many occasions. Do you think the dead also walk cemeteries? I go to cemeteries when researching people, looking for their graves, noting the dates, studying the events, piecing together the story of their lives. I look at their relationships and what part they had in shaping American history. It all fascinates me. It's like digging up buried treasure. Some of these graveyards are very old, going all the way back to the 1700s. So this is the burying place of some people that lived a long time ago, including a person who was tagged as being Mother Goose. But was she the original Mother Goose? I don't think so. Internet says this is the gravesite of the famed Mother Goose. But you can't hardly read the names of most of the stones. The names are just worn off and, and it's impossible to, to read some of the stones, so I have no idea where the mar grave marker is. But we are in the heart of Boston, Massachusetts. Very old graveyard. Some of the dates of death are in the 1700s. And uh, some of the stones are broken, some have fallen down. It's nearly impossible to identify. I'd have to find city records to find out exactly where her stone is. Here is a quick drive-by of the Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, one of five boroughs of New York City. You have a big city, you have a big graveyard, you have tall buildings, and some very tall grave markers. I guess they want to reflect the city from which they come from. A lot of famous people were buried here. Edgar Allan Poe is a one such person. He's the American literary master. We visited Salem, Massachusetts, home of the witch trials. We are entering the cemetery where some of these witches were tried. I think they were hung. I'm not sure if they were burned or hung, but I think thought I read that they were hung. And some of them are buried here in the cemetery in Salem, Massachusetts. Massive trees. The roots of these trees are probably entangled in the bones of the bodies buried here. There are three memorials in Salem, Massachusetts to honor those who were accused, sentenced, and executed. The first is neighboring the old Burying Point Cemetery on Liberty Street. You will see a low granite wall on three sides, lined with stone benches. On each bench is the name of a victim, inscribed along with the date of their execution. The entrance of this memorial and neighboring cemetery are some of the pleas of the victims subscribed into large stones. Even my ninth great-grandmother's very own words are among them. I am wholly innocent of such wickedness. In the middle of the grassy area between the benches were planted six locust trees. Locust trees are the last to flower and the first to lose their leaves, to represent the injustice of their trials. There is now a memorial at Proctor's Ledge where the actual hangings took place. At the time, the victims were hoisted up a tall ladder and hung from a tree. 
Then the ladder was kicked out from underneath them. The bodies were cast into a shallow grave. Some were just tossed over the cliff on the opposite side of the road. No respect for accused witches. There were reports of nearby neighbors, of people crying at night as they came by to reclaim their loved ones' bodies to bury them elsewhere. The lot on the side of the cliff was left empty for many years. It wasn't until the 19th of July in 2017 that a monument was dedicated at that same location. That date marked the 325th anniversary of the executions of Rebecca Nurse, Susanna Martin, Sarah Good, and Elizabeth Howe. The location is named after John Proctor, the former landowner's grandson who was 10th person that was hung there. John Proctor had publicly condemned the witch trials and punished his female servants for claiming to be possessed by witchy spirits. The memorial is in a semicircle around a single oak tree. The victims were likely hung from an oak tree on the ridge above the memorial. It used to look like a ragged old place but now it's cleaned up. Reading from left to right there are 19 names engraved in granite with the date in the order of their execution. Salem is the birthplace of Nathaniel Hawthorne. If you become famous, you might get a statue made of you. If you're anybody, you at least get a headstone on your grave. Nathaniel is a descendant of the witch judge, Colonel John Hawthorne. Note the change of spelling of their last name. The writer wanted to distance himself from the evil deeds of his ancestor, so he added a W to his name. One of my ancestors was the inspiration for the story, The Scarlet Letter. I have a video on my playlist, Stories from History, about that if you want to check it out. My sister and I, with my husband and my oldest son, went to Salisbury Colonial Burying Ground at 24 Beach Road in Salisbury, Massachusetts. We went searching for Mary's gravesite, but we could not find it. I had seen photos posted online of Mary's grave marker, but I'm not even sure this is legit. I'd seen pictures of it online where it, had, it was broken into pieces. I guess over time, people had taken pieces from it so that almost nothing but shards of it remained. How sad that there is no marker for her grave nor her husband's. They were a prominent couple in Salisbury of their day. Here I am standing in the Salisbury colonial burial ground where my eighth -day grandmother was laid to rest and we've been searching but we cannot find stones. There is an effort underway to replace those stones. I don't know if they've taken them and they plan on coming back I think in the spring of 2023 to put new headstones. And this is the place where she was buried in Salisbury. You mean these dead people play ball too? No, it sure seems like somebody took bits and pieces of gravestones and threw them over that wall. No, I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> there was a third memorial in Danvers, which used to be called Salem Village where the fevered frenzy took place. It is called the Witchcraft Victims Memorial, which remembers the 25 innocent people of Danvers who died during the witchcraft hysteria of 1692. 19 were hung. One was pressed to death and five perished while in jail. The memorial features a granite podium with an open Bible. The podium sits on chains connecting a large-scale reproduction of metal shackles. Behind the Bible box is a three-panel granite wall where the names of the victims are inscribed with the date and some of the circumstances of each death and the town of their origin. There are 20 to 25 of the honored dead who were memorialized, but there is one name missing. That is Mary Perkins Bradbury, my ninth great-grandmother from my mother's side of the family. You won't find Mary's name engraved in stone in Salem because she was the only one out of the condemned that escaped out of prison. She was in prison for four months, but she escaped out of prison and therefore she escaped her hanging. 
No one knows for sure how this 70 plus year old woman escaped, but we suspect she had help. She and her husband fled to the state of Maine and remained there until the witch frenzy died down before returning to their home in Salisbury, Massachusetts. I am happy to say that as of this year, 2023, there has been an update on the grave markers for both Mary Perkins Bradbury and her husband, Thomas Bradbury. A movement led by Ray Bradbury Enslin, a Bradbury direct descendant, ten-time granddaughter of Mary, to replace both Thomas and Mary's gravestones. While researching Mary's story last year, I found her GoFundMe page and made a donation to help towards the cause, so I've been following the progress of this. We went to Salem on that day. The, the Salem Witch Dungeon, and they actually told the story of Mary Bradbury, which I knew, but it was interesting to be sitting there in the audience and hear somebody tell it. And on the way home, I stopped here and realized just what bad shape they were in since I'd first seen them, and uh, the next day I started making phone calls. A dedication for the new stones I had planned on attending this ceremony, but had an accident that prevented me from being there. My sister was able to attend the momentous occasion in my stead on June 10th of 2023. If you look in your booklets to a page that says acknowledgments, you will see a list of people and organizations. Every single one of them should feel proud that we're here. Everyone who helped raise money should feel proud. There was no profit, there was no waste. Every drag of effort, every penny was used to get us here. However, without the efforts of one particular person, I can assure you we wouldn't be here at all. It took resolve, it took dedication, it took diplomacy, and it's my tremendous honor to introduce my wife and direct descendant, the incomparable <laughs> Ray Bradbury. <laughs> I've discovered that five years of knocking on the doors of City Hall is a heck of a lot easier for me than giving the speech. This project began five years ago. Getting it rolling was not easy. I had to gather funds, I had to raise awareness, I had to talk to the right people. <laughs> little by little, um, people started to find out what I was up to. I started hearing from family members, because you guys came out of the woodwork. People started asking how they could help. And I wanted to say that not everybody that's involved in this is a Bradbury. I started chronicling my adventures early on on social media, and uh, a lot of friends got very invested in the process. Quite a few of them are here today. Guys, you are Bradburys today. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and with all the support, funds started to roll in, things started to happen, and there was a brief pandemic that derailed things a little bit. <laughs> but we got here, and we got here together. This was something that took a lot of people to finally get to come to fruition. Good afternoon, everyone. Be attentive to the word of the Lord. It was said of Mary in her time that she was a virtuous woman. So I turn to Proverbs in the Old Testament, chapter 31, verses 10 through 31. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price far above ruby? The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax, and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like a merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and portion to her maiden. She considereth a field, and buyeth it with the fruit of her hands, and planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengthens her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, and her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands to the distaff. She stretcheth out a hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all of her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry, clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gate when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of she looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excelleth 
them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. The end of the reading. The New Plymouth Guard reenactors paid their tributes to Thomas and Mary. In about 1650. This is the time that Captain Thomas Bradbury would have been in an equivalent role up here in the colony of Massachusetts. Um, part of the militia orders of 1636 uh, specified what a militia should do, what soldiers should uh, comport themselves, what they should have for equipment. However, a salient part of the orders are that when any of this military company shall die or depart of this life, the company upon warning shall come together with arms and inter his corpse as a soldier and according to his place and quality. To that end, we will render salute and honors to Captain Thomas Bradbury, Massachusetts Colony Militia. Company, about hey! Boys, your peace. Take up your piece in your left hand. Open your pan and clear your pan. Prime your pan. Cast them out to the left. Take your charge. Load your charge. Withdraw your scouring stick. Ram your charge. Return your scouring stick. Open your pan. Present. Give fire. Another round. Report arms. Render honors to Captain Thomas Bradford. Two. Put up your arm. Shoulder your arm. About. Hey. My prayer is that our society does not forget the lesson taught us by that dark period in American history, for without it, we have no true justice. The monuments that have now been erected in and around Salem acknowledge the great tragedy of the innocent blood that was shed during the dark eight days of 1692. Lady Justice is blind, so she cannot prejudge a matter innocent until proven guilty. The blindfold represents the impartiality and objectivity of the law and that it doesn't let outside factors such as politics, wealth, or fame to influence its decisions. She holds in one hand a pair of balanced scales to represent two sides of the case. Both sides must be considered to be sure that justice is done. The other hand holds a sword which symbolizes symbolizes enforcement and respect and means that justice stands by its decision and ruling and is able to take action. The fact that the sword is unsheathed and very visible is a sign that justice is transparent and not an implement of fear. A double-edged blade signifies that justice can rule against either of the parties once the evidence has been examined and it is bound to enforce the ruling as well as protect or defend the innocent party. Final, there is now a new mark for Thomas and Mary's gravesite to honor them and for their generations of descendants to remember them. My production of this video is also a way of honoring the brave woman who stood for truth refused to associate herself with any semblance of evil. She refused to confess to witchcraft and so therefore died with honor and grace. 
after the witch trials passed she returned to her home to live out the remaining seven years of her life in her home in salisbury i also drove by the site of her home the original home burned down in years past there is now a newer home on that location mary died of natural causes in her own bed at home mary perkins bradbury was the only woman who left the hangman hanging restitution was paid to the surviving families the city has done what they could to right the wrongs that were done in sixteen ninety two the members of the jury even wrote a public letter apologizing for their part that letter was signed by one of my ancestors from my father's side of the family his name was john batchelder the other members of the jury also signed it after the debacle of the salem witch trials our legal justice system fashioned its laws to include due process rights as described in the bible which lends the concept of innocent until proven guilty thank you for hanging out in cemeteries with me <laughs> i hope you learned something for more on mary's story see both my videos the witch in my family and the real demon of salem <laughs>